which was published in 1994. And we have full intentions of following up this report with everything else that Barbara and Ted and I have continued to uncover and are continuing to pursue at this point as soon as it's feasible to get this material back out to you as, as a sequel, a follow-up, an ongoing investigation. A full account of our first two years of work is found in Masquerade of Angels, but for brevity's sake today, I'm going to focus on only three aspects of the uh, alien ag agenda as it relates to the material that Ted and Barbara and I have, have had to deal with. The first matter is the intrinsic deception at the heart of this agenda. And that's something that's become clearer with every new report that surfaces. Whether we choose to call it screen memory, telepathic mind control, technological mind control, or virtual reality scenarios, the entities involved in the abduction phenomenon employ masterful illusory capabilities. And I don't think the importance of this fact can be stressed strongly enough. It must affect all of our thinking and our research when it comes to these alien-human contacts. In Ted's experiences, for example, there were several occasions where such masquerading techniques were employed, and I could spend, as I said, the rest of the morning just dealing with these, and I'm going to be making very brief references and hope you maybe want to read about the rest of it in the book. One instance involved the appearance of Ted's deceased grandfather, on board a craft into which he and his grandmother had been taken when Ted was a young boy. Um, I think I spoke about this a couple of years ago when I was uh, first working on Ted's material and I didn't identify that this was Ted's story I was referring to. The scenario involved persuading his grandmother uh, to engage in a sexual activity with an non-human entity and when she refused to do so saying she had only ever made love with her husband and he was dead the aliens produced the dead husband in another instance uh, Ted watched a scenario that surely was not occurring in normal reality terms uh, I call it a virtual reality scenario and this began shortly after he had heard a very quiet sound like helicopter blades <coughs> And in this ongoing event, after the helicopter blade noise, uh, Ted watched as a, a human-looking entity dressed in military clothes uh, pop through the ceiling into the room, holding a young child that was very, very similar to Ted's appearance at the same age. And Ted was told that uh, they were going to return that which had been taken from him. And an account of what followed from that, again, is, is in the book, and uh, I won't take time to recite everything there to you, but the virtual reality event, there was certainly no human paratrooper popping through the ceiling carrying a young child in reality terms. But the illusion was quite as real as you and I here today. But perhaps the most illuminating of such events that uh, we in, were able to investigate involved Ted and another woman, a woman, who witnessed a third person, another woman, undergoing her own virtual reality episode, again marked at the onset by the sound of a helicopter. Now, some of you may be quick, as they say in the OJ trial, to rush to get judgment on this and conclude that these events were generated by some terrestrial, governmental, or military covert mind control operation. After all, we've got helicopter blades out there. But it should be noted that only the targeted person in these events heard the helicopters, while others in the same house or same room did not. I don't think our terrestrial helicopters are that selective in the noise they generate. I, believed, uh, I believe now that the reported and confirmed details in all of these reports are strong evidence against accepting consciously recalled alien encounter reports at face value because of the illusion capabilities, because of the screens, and because of the virtual reality technology that we have witnessed being manifest by these entities. I believe that if we build our theories on, the, on such information, the consciously reported information only, we're building on sand, on illusions that the aliens create for us, and I think to confuse and mislead us. 
Now, this is not to say, however, that all alien encounters are virtual reality events, because there is also plenty of very strong evidence for the physical nature of many of these encounters. So to be perfectly objective, the definition of abduction would have to include any event or scenario that is generated externally for the targeted person, whether it be a physical encounter, a virtual reality scenario, or a telepathic con contact. Now, a second important discovery from Ted's investigation, and this was important at least for me, was the possibility of cloned human bodies produced by these abductors. And that's the second thing I'd like to, to talk about briefly today. In the mid-1970s, um, a memory of a childhood event surfaced in Ted's mind during the night while he was sleeping. And in an altered state of consciousness, he got out of bed and went to his typewriter in the middle of the night and wrote out this memory as a story. In 1991 and 92, when Ted and Barbara began a series of regressions, it occurred, it popped up in these events, this scenario that Ted had recalled as a story, but a very different version of that basic story emerged. Uh, a version in which he went through what can only be called a horrific experience, in which his original body he perceived as being killed and taken away, and his essence, for lack of a better word, we could call it soul energy or whatever term one would like to use, was contained temporarily in a black <coughs> box, placed on a counter, and uh, transferred shortly thereafter into a cloned copy of young Ted's body. This was his perception of what occurred with him, and this is the first time I had ever heard of such things really in any detail. Now, when we made our in external investigation, interviewing people who were part of Ted's family and friends at the times many of these things occurred, several pieces of corroborating items did come out, mm -hmm. all of which I tried to prevent, present fully in the book, but just briefly, one of the most telling, for me at least, was interviewing uh, Ted's mother. And at the time that Ted recalled being transferred into a different body, his mother recalled the suffering he went through for weeks afterwards, feeling that his body was on fire, having to soak him repeatedly in ice water trying to bring him some comfort, and noting that the childhood diseases that Ted had had before the cloning recurred afterwards. <clears throat> Excuse me. The third point that I want to correlate uh, with information from subsequent investigations in the accounts in Taken concerns the possible involvement of human, apparently military, personnel with certain abductees. Now, if nothing else, this involvement of some authoritative agency within our government should tell us that our decision-making powers that be, the structure that pretty much controls how we deal with this phenomenon as well as with everything else going on in our society, takes this phenomenon very seriously. I would guess that most of you here have already learned about the many hard pieces of evidence that do reveal the government's knowledge uh, of and involvement with the UFO question. Um, such classic presentations as um, those in clear intent and above top secret can point you in the direction of getting your hands on the paperwork generated by the government. That, that makes it very clear they have involvement they have never been willing to discuss with the public. Now, the evidence for our military involvement with abductees, I will admit, is much less well documented, certainly, but for the inv individuals who are on the receiving end of this activity, it is very compelling and very traumatic. There are two basically different bodies of data relating to the possibility of human involvement. Now, the first body of data includes such external things as phone taps, mail interference, unidentified human agents who photograph the homes of abductees, photograph abductees themselves and follow them, sometimes even breaking into their homes, making threatening phone calls, uh, apparently able to make certain medical records disappear, 
uh, also alleged alien artifacts disappear. And it goes all the way to the extent of direct confrontations between the military personnel and certain abductees. Sometimes to the extent of abducting the person and using a number of interrogation techniques to elicit information about the person act person's activities with the aliens. Now, Ted Rice um, has not been the overt target of such involvement, but the accounts uh, of the eight women in Taken, which we'll get to in just a few moments, show that four of the eight women have had a variety of these experiences in their own uh, series of events. But the second body of data concerns, concerning human uh, involvement deals with facilities typically underground, in which aliens are often seen to be working with human, military, and scientific personnel. For me, and I think for all of us, probably the big question is whether these facilities and this level of cooperation actually exist, or if abductees report these events because they've been pre presented with some type of unreal scenario, much as we're presented with the showing of a movie when we go to a theater. Until we have located such a facility, externally verified its existence, and exposed the activities going on there that abductees report, this question's got to remain open. All we can say for sure is this. A number of unrelated accounts include descriptions of such facilities, usually with reference to either scientific or military activity, Although there is a third set of reports that describes something much more disturbing, and this is uh, one of the things that turned up in the case with Ted and with certain others who are part of a great deal of investigative activity on Barbara's part and my part, that are, well, I'll just try to give you a little brief scenario of what Ted consciously recalled about this third type of human underground facility. In the mid-1980s, Ted uh, awoke one morning with conscious memories of an altered state event that occurred during the night. He was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the time. And part of the journey that he recalled from the night before included flying over a fairly desert area to a remote compound where many people were herded together. He didn't remember being involved in any actual activity, but only in seeing several areas that were accessed through this above-ground compound into a large underground installation. He remembered consciously that the humans in the compound seemed extremely despondent, quite miserable, and he recalls shouting out in anger to a couple of these people sitting there, or the people who were doing the things to the humans, you can't do that. You can't treat our people like cattle. And being outraged, entirely outraged by whatever it was he had seen, but consciously only recalling the outrage, only recalling his protest, and not recalling what it was he had seen that, that generated this protest. Now, this account is also included in Masquerade, and it is one of the memories that Ted and Barbara have been able to explore with regressive hypnosis after the time that Masquerade was written. So we have uh, more information to report on this, and I'll try to make sure that the report on all of our work that sheds new light on what we've already presented in Masquerade will get out to you as soon as possible. What Ted recalled at the time of the regressive hypnosis is without doubt outrageous and horrifying to any human sensibility. And I would remind you that such is and hope you maybe want to read about the rest of it in the book. One instance involved the appearance of Ted's deceased grandfather on board a craft into which he and his grandmother had been taken when Ted was a young boy. Um, I think I spoke about this a couple of years ago when I was uh, first working on Ted's material and I didn't identify that this was Ted's story I was referring to. The scenario involved persuading his grandmother uh, to engage in aspects of the uh, alien ag agenda as it relates to the material that Ted and Barbara and I have, have had to deal with. The first matter is the intrinsic deception at the heart of this agenda, and that's something that's become clearer with every new report that surfaces. Whether we choose to call it screen memory, 
telepathic mind control, technological mind control, or virtual reality scenarios, the entities involved in the abduction phenomenon employ masterful illusory capabilities. And I don't think the importance of this fact can be stressed strongly enough. It must affect all of our thinking and our research when it comes to these alien-human contacts. In Ted's experiences, for example, there were several occasions where such masquerading techniques were employed, and I could spend, as I said, the rest of the morning just dealing with these, and I'm going to be making very brief reference, which was published in 1994. And we have full intentions of following up this report with everything else that Barbara and Ted and I have continued to uncover and are continuing to pursue at this point as soon as it's feasible to get this material back out to you as, as a sequel, a follow-up, an ongoing investigation. A full account of our first two years of work is found in Masquerade of Angels, but for brevity's sake today, I'm going to focus on only three as a sexual activity with an non-human entity and when she refused to do so saying she had only ever made love with her husband and he was dead the aliens produced the dead husband in another instance uh, Ted watched a scenario that surely was not occurring in normal reality terms uh, I call it a virtual reality scenario and this began shortly after he had heard a very quiet sound like helicopter 